الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد continuing on in our lecture series and inshallah ta'ala hopefully this will be the last uh, dars or last lesson in the book by Sheikh Ahmed al Atik entitled uh, Summarized Chapters of the Islamic Creed. So the last thing we left off, we were discussing about the Qadr and we talked about the levels of the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine creed and divine destiny. And then we finished off by talking about Ihsan, which is noted in the Hadith of Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam when Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam asked the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam of Ihsan. And he said, إِن تَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تُكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ That Ihsan, it means to worship Allah as if you see Him. And since you don't see Him, know that He subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. And we talked about some of the benefits of this, that when somebody has Ihsan, this level of Iman, or this level of Islam, because Islam has different levels, there's Islam, there's Iman, and there's Ihsan, and these are different maratib of Islam. And they vary the people, people who are just Muslims, well, alhamdulillah, that's a great, great ni'mah and favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the mu'min has favor over the Muslim. That's the one who, who is even increased in Iman and they stay away from the Muharramah. And the Muhsin is the one who does the even higher levels of Ibadah, and, the, the, and they stay away from the doubtful issues, and they uh, domestically sunnah. This is the mercy, the one who's doing all the righteous deeds, and they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Islam has different levels, and those are the three levels, maratib al deen. And ihsan is something we all want to get, because it, it helps us to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we have ihsan. When we worship Allah, as if we see Him, then of course we're going to fear Him. And we're going to stay away from the Muharramat. And we're going to be concentrated and focused. And if we realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees us, then from Tawheed and from Iman, it will help us to stay away from sins. And may Allah forgive us for our shortcomings for being so weak and not trying to avoid the sins, but in fact doing open sins, many of us, Wa'iyadu billah, may Allah forgive us all and help the Muslims everywhere I mean. The... Next chapter, the chap, the, the Sheikh went on to say chapter 28, and he said, he, he began talking about as many of the books of, of creed and ittiqad of Ahl Sunnah from the Salaf until the, uh, up until this day and age, that many of the early books, they had a chapter specifically, specifically regarding the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is for Muslims. The Shia, they dislike this. They hate this. Why? Because the Shia don't even care and don't take from Bukhari Muslim. But us as Muslims, we consider those the most authentic sources after the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the perfect speech of Allah. And after the Qur'an, the most authentic written book would be Sahih al-Bukhari. And then Sahih Muslim. Those are the, the best. That's what makes up the, 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 what you'll find in the backpack of the believer. Because the believer knows that those authentic hadith of the Prophet wasallam is how we come closer to Allah by practicing the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. That's how we know the sunnah. Because of those great imams of the sunnah who helped preserve the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. The companions are the best of mankind after the Prophet. Alayhim salatu wasallam. May Allah be pleased with all the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiya Allah ta'ala anhu majma'een walau kariya ahla to shayya walau kariya a shia even if the shia hate it even if the people are influenced by the shia creed they hate that they hate that you love the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's companion radiya Allah ta'ala anhu majma'een and may every time we say that dua may Allah be pleased with them I hope that it hurts the hearts of those shia and shakes the foundation of their creed and shakes the foundation of their hearts so that they may leave the evil they're upon. Because as Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, that the, uh, the Shia, the Raq of the Shia, Aqfar min Yahud Nasar, they have more Kufr, more disbelief, more Zandaka, men a Yahud Nasar, they have more disbelief than the Jews and the Christians. Because think about it, 
How many Jews and Christians do you know will curse the Sahaba? They don't. They don't even know who the Sahaba are. And they gen generally uh, have general respect, maybe respect you in a certain different way, unless someone's just ignorant and they're arrogant and stuff. But the practicing ones, generally, they're going to deal with you in a respectful manner. And they'll respect your re religious symbols and your religious uh, rituals, and they'll respect you generally. Because they don't want you to disrespect their symbols and rituals. The companions of the best of mankind after the Prophet ﷺ, A companion is whoever met the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ as a believer in him and died upon that belief even if he had apostated before returning back to Islam then died as a believer. So yes, there, there were some, a few, who had actually did something and left Islam and then they came back. But as long as they met the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi as a believer, having met the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then they're a companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, radiyallahu taala anhu majmaeen. The following is compulsory, compulsory upon us regarding the companions, radiyallahu taala anhu, radiyallahu taala anhu. Number one, a healthy heart, free from malice and spite, and also a tongue free from demeaning and degrading their ability. So we should never uh, speak ill about the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the Ittifad of Ahl Sunnah. And with regard to that, the Prophet ﷺ said, La tusubu ashabi. He said, do not curse my, my uh, companions. The Prophet ﷺ said, he said, it's upon you, my sunnah, and the sunnah of the rightly guided khala, khalifah. Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, wa Ali, may Allah be pleased with all of them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when he talked about the saved sect and those who will be uh, saved from the hellfire, he said, he said, whoever is upon what I'm upon, meaning the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his sahaba and his companions, that should be sufficient for us as believers to not have any ill feeling, anything with regards to even what happened, the, 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 the uh, fighting that took place between so, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, leave those issues, leave those issues, because what they did of trouble and what they did out of ijtihad, meaning out of all of their benefit, and even if they had ijtihad, some of them, you know, they believed that their opinion was 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 more correct in that issue, and they were using Islamic jurisprudent reasoning, and they might have made a mistake. And some, a party of them was correct. But they will all be rewarded as the companions of the Prophet And this is in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet where he said that the, if, uh, the person who rules, meaning the judge, the one who's qualified, the one who has ill, the one who has sex, the one who has wara, the one who makes a ruling and he makes a mistake in his ruling, he receives a reward. And if he gets it correct, he receives two rewards. But this is not the case for the jahid, the one who's ignorant in the religion. The one who's ignorant and then tries to make ijtihad based on their ignorance, they try to make uh, jurisprudence re reasoning from their own understanding, this person will be in sin. And even though scholars say even if he gets the issue right, he's in sin. Because he's not, he doesn't have the knowledge, he doesn't have the ability, he doesn't have the taqwa, taqwa wa He has no right to be making fatawa and, and doing these, these issues. These are for Ahl al as Imam Bukhari said in his chapter, al amr qabla wa quli wal amr And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, Sa'lam, innu la ilaha illallah, wasabfil li dhimbik. And know, la ilaha illallah, that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. And seek forgiveness for yourself and the believing men and the believing women. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us with amr. So it is not for us to engage in matters which we have no knowledge of. Going back to the topic at hand, regarding the Sahara radiallahu ta'ala that our hearts should be free from any malice or any, uh, any uh, type of degradation or demeaning behavior or demeaning statement about them radiallahu ta'ala ajma'in. Number two, being pleased with him. We should be pleased with the Sahara 
Sahaba to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu alayhi wa sallam The third thing, the firm belief that they were all just. All Sahaba were adala. They, that they are the most knowledgeable. And they were more knowledgeable than whoever came after them. Radiyallahu alayhi wa sallam Regarding the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were there during the revelation. How is it? If there is a Shia that's listening to this. How do you think your imams have more knowledge than the companions of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And if you think your imams are infallible and knew the unseen, as many of the Rafidi and the Twelvers and these other ones believe, how is it that your imams know this and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was only given so much knowledge of the ghayb? How? How is it that you, you believe that your imams, you have so much faith in them compared to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book? and what his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with, and what the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was upon, and what the companions of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiallahu ta'ala majma'in, what they understood of the religion, they were the most knowledgeable, they were there during the wahi, during the revelation, radiallahu ta'ala majma'in. So, we should have firm belief that they were just, that they are the most knowledgeable, and more knowledgeable than anyone who came after them regarding uh, the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So since the affair is like this, then it is compulsory to follow in their footsteps in knowledge and in deeds due to the general saying of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what I am upon and what my companions are upon. As I just mentioned this statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, uh, when they ask who are they, uh, Rasulullah said, Man kana ala misli wa ma kana alayhi wa ashabi. So whoever is upon what I'm upon and what my companions are upon. The fourth thing is we should refrain from speaking about the conflict between the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the next chapter, the Shaykh said, the best of the companions is the rightly guided Khalifa, uh, Abu Bakr, then Umar, then Uthman, then Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in. Then the rest of the ten who were promised paradise, and they are uh, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, uh, Sa'ad bin uh, Abi Waqaf, Abdurrahman bin Auf, Zubair bin Awad, Talha, uh, Talha uh, ibn Ubaidullah, and Sa'id ibn Zayd, Ibn Amr bin Nufayl. Then the rest of the companions who fought him in Badr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in. Then the companions who took the pledge under the tree, they took the bay'ah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then whoever became Muslim before the conquest of Mecca and fighting took place, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in. Then whoever became Muslim after the conquest of Mecca and fighting, may Allah be pleased with them all. This is the the, how Ahl Sunnah, how we feel about the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in. The family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are those who were prohibited from receiving charity. And they are the family of Ali, the family of Jafar, the family of Aqil, the family of Abbas, and Banu al Harith bin uh, Abdul Muttalib, and the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his daughters, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in. Then Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah loves the family of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and has great love and admiration for them and respects them for he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said Allah will remind you regarding my family except whoever differed from the Sunnah and was not straight in the religion amongst them. So any of them just because they're from Ahl Bayt but if they weren't correct in their religion and their Aqidah and their, and their actions then of course they don't have the same status as those who were upon the sunnah, firm upon the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in obedience to Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. Ahl sunnah loves the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and has great admiration, a, a, admiration for them and sees them as the mothers of the believers. And they are the wives of him in paradise, especially Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, the mother of most of his children and the first to believe in him and support him in Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him all. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married 11 women and during his life two died. They were Khadija and Zainab. And the nine who died after them were Aisha, Hafsa, Zainab, uh, bin Jash, Jash, uh, Um Salama, 
Safiya, Maimuna, Um Habiba, Soda, and Jawahira. Faith to Ahl Sunnah involve, uh, involves speech and action. So then the Sheikh, after speaking about that important pillar in creed, which was the Sahaba, loving the Sahaba and not speaking ill about them, and knowing that they are the best of the Ummah after the Prophet Salehim after Salatu Wasalam Radiallahu Ta'ala Anu Majmaeen, then the Shaykh went on to talk about Iman more with tafsir, with details. He said, Faith to Allah Sunnah involves speech and actions and statements of the heart, or actions of the heart, and on the tongue, and actions in the heart, meaning intentions, trust, and reliance, and of the limbs. Many issues comprise this great chapter. Number one, those good deeds are from faith and they comprise a pillar of it. So good deeds are from faith and they, they are a pillar of faith. Number two, that faith increases and decreases. It increases with obedience to Allah and it decreases with disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, that faith differs in the hearts of the believers, some strong in faith and others weak in faith. Number four, that the major sins do not take someone outside the fold of Islam. This is very important, and this is a, a refutation of the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij, who believe that the sinner, the major sinner, is a disbeliever. They no longer have any iman. So they negate iman in totality. They either say iman is full, or iman is, is totally, uh, someone possesses no iman. So the Khawarij, they have no middle ground. So is the Mu'tazila, no middle ground. And a difference between the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij is the Khawarij, so they believe the, uh, wicked, the, the sinner is going to be in the hellfire forever. The Mu'tazila believes the wicked sin, sinner uh, is bain among the latain, that they're neither in the paradise and they're neither in the hellfire, and they're in between those two places. Wa'iyadu billah min kufr wa dharal wa bid'ah. So, the third thing the Shaykh mentioned is that faith differs in the hearts of the believers, some strong in faith and others weak that the major sins do not take someone outside of the fold of Islam except if they make the sins lawful or it is mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah as disbelief. So something that's men mentioned in the text as disbelief and it is known to be from the major disbelief taking you out of the fold of Islam, then of course doing that action takes you out of the fold of Islam. Or, for example, if someone tries to make the lawful sins, I mean the lawful actions, unlawful or vice versa. For example, if someone says they drink alcohol and they say alcohol is halal for me, alcohol is lawful for me. Well, this is taken something which is known by necessity from the religion of Islam to be unlawful. And if this person is now making it lawful, then this person is a disbeliever. They have left the fold of Islam. They are no longer a Muslim. They do not pray with them. They are not to be prayed upon if they die. They do not be, they're not buried with the Muslims, uh, etc. and all the other uh, Afghan related to that and re regarding inheritance and so forth. The fifth thing is that disbelief can be in creed, speech, and deed. The sixth thing is that the sinner who worships the law alone, who's a muahid, meaning that they're on tawheed, they're a Muslim, and dies without making repentance, then his affairs with the law, insha, or if he wills, he will forgive him, and if he wills, he will punish him. For Allah the Almighty said, In the law, la yaghfiru an yushrika bihi, wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika naman yasha. Verily, Allah does not forgive associating partners with him, and he forgives other than that for whosoever he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, pleases. So, that lets us know this is an important uh, aspect of creed it with Ahl Sunnah and where we differ with the Khawariz and Ma'tazila and some other groups, is that we believe that the major sinner is under the, is at the will of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning that if someone died and they were an adulterer and or, or, or they were, you know, someone who takes drugs or whatever they're doing that's a major sin, a liar, uh, whatever, that this person, as long as they're still Muslim when they die, doing this major sin, then if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes, he will punish them, and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes, this individual will be pardoned. And if they're punished, the belief of Abba Sunnah in accordance with the Kitab and the Sunnah is that this individual will be uh, taken out of the hellfire. So maybe a person might be cleansed. They may be put in the hellfire for a term and have to have their sins expiated in the hellfire. And then they will go to paradise to be with their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. The seventh thing regarding Iman 
is that the sinful Mu'ad, if he enters the fire, then he will not remain there forever, as we just said. And the eighth thing is that disbelief is of two types, and we mentioned this in the beginning, and shirk, uh, polytheism, is also of two types. Likewise, oppression, there's two types of oppression. There's also two types of hypocrisy, and two types of transgression, and sins and mistakes. All of these are comprised of two types, or mentioned in two categories, as the scholars of Islam have mentioned by following the Nasus and going into the text of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the statements of the, of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and going and looking at the evidence to derive that these things have two categories. And one, the, the, the point mentioning with all these two types of, the two types of disbelief, two types of shirk, two types of transgressions, transgression, two types of oppression, two types of hypocrisy, is that one category from amongst all of those uh, different uh, sins and so forth takes a person out of the fold of Islam. And the other type does not take them out of the fold of the, of the religion. Meaning that there's a major kufr and there's a minor kufr. There's a major shirk and there's a minor shirk. There's a major hypocrisy and there's a minor hypocrisy. And etc. The nice thing is it is permissible to take exception regarding Iman, saying, Inshallah, and a mu'min. For example, if someone asks you, are you a believer? Say, Inshallah, I'm a believer. But, of course, being sure in your heart that you're a Muslim. You should never have doubt. And I know a real story that this happened to me here in Saudi Arabia when I worked with an individual who was, uh, he had come to Saudi Arabia and he had a Muslim Iqama, meaning a Muslim residence permit. But in fact, he, he never prayed, he never practiced Islam. He took his shahada with some individuals of uh, ill repute in the Emirates. You know, these were uh, bad people who claimed to be Muslim. I don't know if they're Muslim or not. I don't know all the details. But this individual, I asked him, I took him to the masjid one day and he prayed, and the people rejoiced, matter of fact. But during the prayer, he spoke during the whole prayer. He said, oh, oh gosh, I forgot this part. Oh, I forgot this part. He was doing the rakul, and he was actually talking during the prayer. So then I admonished him afterwards, and was trying to bring him back. And then I asked him one day, because I saw that he didn't seem to have any desire to really follow up. He prayed the one day, and after that we never saw him again, and he still had a lot of uh, very doubtful issues in his life. And... I asked him once, are you a Muslim? And he said, oh, I don't know. This is not istithna. This is not what they're talking about, the ulama here. This right here, if a person says they doubt, they don't, they're not sure if they're a Muslim, that means they are not a Muslim. There's no doubt that you're a Muslim or whether you're not a Muslim. You don't say, if someone says, are you a Muslim? And you say, oh, I don't know. Or I'm not sure. I, maybe I am. I, you know, no. This is, this is kufr. This is disbelief. That person is not a Muslim. A Muslim is sure. They believe in Allah. And they believe in the Prophet Sallallahu example and his sunnah. And they follow it. This is what being a Muslim is. It isn't a doubtful issue of being here or there and everywhere. Or as some of the people say, and this is also a situation that's real in my city, we have several priest, uh, priestesses, women preachers and priestesses, who say they are Catholic Muslims or that she's a Christian Muslim, or whatever. And this is absolutely rejected. She finds a lot of things she likes about Islam, but she still wants to remain the pastor of her church, or the priestess of her, her congregation and the Catholic uh, faith. Absolutely impossible. You cannot have Iman and Kofar together like that. Because the, the foundation of those beliefs are in contradiction. Whereas Islam calls you to Islamic monotheism, Catholicism calls you, calls you to the Father, the Son, and the Holy uh, spirit and etc. So you cannot have uh, any, there is no uh, combining the two. But in fact, Islam is one religion and it is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The tenth thing regarding Iman is that repentance is accepted from the one who worships Allah if he meets the conditions of repentance. And this is very important to know and understand the conditions for repenting and so the, some of the conditions for repenting are that a person has the desire to, they, they, they're firm in their desire to leave that sin. Another thing is that they feel sorrow about the sin that they did and they are firm about trying not to go back to the sin 
and that they have sincerity to Allah in their repentance and those are some of the main pillars or conditions for making repentance and if the repentance re revolves another person meaning that a person stole something from someone or it has to do with the right of the other person then you must return that right as also a part of that condition for repentance so for example if someone has stolen something from someone then part of their repentance after they feel the sorrow and, and make repentance and, and forgiveness to their Lord and so forth is that they return that item to that person if they're able to do so or compensate for it in some way or another so this is a part of what Islamic repentance is and we don't have to go to the priest or the preacher for that the next chapter the Sheikh went on to talk about Ahlul Sunnah Ahl Sunnah al Jamaat. he said Ahlul Sunnah believe in the miracles in the friends of Allah meaning the awliya meaning the saints the awliya of Allah are pious believers and every believer who fears Allah then he is a friend or wali of Allah in accordance with the level of his faith and piety. And this is very important for us to understand that awliya are on different levels. That people who are uh, the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who are supported by Allah, they have different levels. They have different levels of demand. There are those who are very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they have so much piety. They fear Allah and they have knowledge. Because you will never have true piety in Islam without knowledge. You can never have someone who never studied anything about Islam being really piety. Maybe they cry, maybe they do they do a lot of worship, but real piety comes from ilm. Because you can only know who Allah is by studying about him. It's not all you're not receiving wahi, you're not receiving revelation. That's ended with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the only way that we know who Allah is is by going to the Quran and going to the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the only way we know how to practice Islam is by going to the Quran and going to the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and going to the understanding of the Sahaba and the Ijma of the Ulama, the Ijma of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama. That's how we know and understand uh, the religion of Islam and how to practice it and how to be an awliya, how to be someone close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to realize that Although the extreme Sufis seem to think that a wali is just one individual, it's this one who's very pious in their eyes. Maybe he doesn't take a shower, whatever the case is. Some of them believe that some they're pious, pious because they're unclean and they wear one thob and stuff like this. But that's not real piety. Piety is, is removing your heart from the dunya. This is what asceticism is. Asceticism in Islam is removing your heart from loving the dunya. So that means even a wealthy person could be that pious uh, wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They could be wealthy and not love anything from the dunya. Allah favored them with wealth and they spend it here and there and everywhere for the sake of Allah. They spend it on talab al -ilm. They spend it on jihad fi They spend it on, uh, on, on, on sadaqah, and, uh, you know, charity. And they spend it on helping people everywhere. This is uh, the, the people who are the only of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people who are in obedience and have iman. And so, uh, the awliya, they, uh, a person can be a friend of Allah in accordance with the level of his or her faith and piety. And Allah has made apparent extraordinary signs called miracles bestowing honor from Allah as a reward for following the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it is not that every friend of, uh, of Allah receives a miracle. This is very important too. Not everyone who is a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves receives miracles. Verily, it is only for some of them. As for when someone gains some extraordinary signs from the wicked people that do not know Allah and do not tread the path of the Sunnah, then this is not a miracle. Instead, it is char charlatanism, fraud or magic. So, we have to also real realize that every time we see someone doing something which we perceive as a miracle, or we see that something that is it's very strange out of the ordinary or it's uh, something that we're amazed by, it does not mean that they're a friend of Allah. Because there are many people of disbelief who have, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, they've been given some aspects of knowing, you know, of intuition or knowing uh, something of the future because they deal with jinn or they deal with spirits, they deal with magic, they deal with all kinds of sorcery and things like this. So this is from the wicked sign. This is not the good things and this is not a sign that they are close to Allah. So don't be amazed when you see someone and they summon jinn out of the wall or something like this or you've seen them fly or, or something like this. You know, that's out extra, uh, that's out of the ordinary for us. 
Don't be amazed by this and think that they are unrighteousness, because that could be from the shaitan. As, as you, you can see, that many people are possessed and they do many uh, strange things, crawling walls, uh, jumping, floating in the air, all kind of scary things. Why? This is not from Allah. This is not the good things. This is not good miracles or anything. This is from the shaitan to make you and to make, I, make myself uh, go off the path of khayr. So very important to know that some of the things can be fraud or magic or charlatanism. Some of the pious predecessors said, meaning the Salaf al-Fadi, they used to say, anhum, If you see a man walking on the water or flying through the air, then do not become amazed until you know if he is upon the Sunnah, following the traditions of the Prophet wasallam. So that's very important. Following the Sunnah is the Ibrah. That's the Shahid here. That's the main point, is that when you want to judge a person by their character and their conduct, and if you see something amazing from them, if they're in accordance with the sunnah, then yes, then you should be amazed, and this is probably a sign of, of great goodness. But if you see that they're a person who's known for wickedness and fisk and sinfulness, then you want to be aware because possibly this person could be uh, into magic or uh, working with the jinn or, or some other type of, as they say, black magic or, you know, devil, devilish tricks. Ahl sunnah ti wal jama'a believes the main group of Muslims is necessary and they see that hearing and obeying whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives authority to over them in goodness is compulsory. And they hold the opinion that jihad fi sabidillah and hajj establishing the Friday prayer and Eid holidays with the leaders is compulsory. Whether they be pious or wicked, this is incredibly important, this is a, a, a pillar of the creed of Ahl Sunnah. They do not believe in rebelling and encourage the people to conspire against them. And, and I want to bring up a very important point. Look at, look at what we have today. With all of the so-called Arab Springs that we've seen in Tunisia, we saw it in Egypt, we've seen it in Yemen, we see it in uh, some other countries, it, it's describing. And now, last but not least, we see what, what's going on to our brothers and sisters in Syria, what they're facing. And may Allah preserve them, protect them, raise them up and bless them in prayer and protect their, their children and, and grant them uh, Jannah to Pardos and gr grant them His mercy, Subhanah. And may Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala humiliate the Ghadameen who are attacking and killing them and slaughtering them. And may Allah send His angels to deal with them and put them in their rightful place under the feet of the believers there. And so, what we see from all of these aspects of the so-called out of spring, this rebellion against the leaders. Although some of the leaders were known to be dis known to have left the fold of Islam in accordance with the ulama and those people who look at these issues and look at the conditions for takfir and look at for the criterion of takfir and look at the muana, those prohibited prohibitors of takfir, they look at those things and they're people of knowledge and they're people who can make these rulings and judgments. That some of those leaders were uh, ruled to be uh, um, non-Muslim, to have left the fold, to have apostated. However, in almost all of those conditions, all of those situations, the people didn't have the ability to overcome their situation. Look at the bloodshed that we still have. Look at what Syria, what's going on. I have a student from Syria. He tells me that, you know, daily a hundred or something people are being slaughtered. You know, we have, uh, we, you know, the, 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 the documentation is there. What's going on is, is deplorable. It's, it's horrible. It's a human tragedy and travesty. And also the methodology and what brought about brought this, this uh, terrible situation was against the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, these rebellions. Because they did not, have, even, if they, even if Bashar is not a Muslim, but to rebel against him, you see that the people didn't have the ability. So then their children and their women are, are paying for this. And they're old men. And all the people are paying. And it just continues and it continues. They're outgunned. They have the backing of Iran. These, these, uh, because Bashar and those, those Hizbabah, they are communist, uh, um, communist, Arab nationalist, Shia. That's what they, they, their beliefs are. Just a mix of all that filth. So when you have that much filth in that cesspool, they are backed by the people of, set, uh, of, of filth. The people who have a filthy Aqidah, who hate the Sahaba to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
who kill Abu Sunnah and who have always killed Abu Sunnah during history. So this is, they're, they're glad to turn their guns on the people and slaughter them like sheep. So the people didn't have the ability to rebel against this leader. That's one of the conditions. If the leader is not, uh, no longer in the fold of Islam, there are conditions also for rebellion. And these principles that Islam and the ulama have laid out over time since the beginning uh, that we get from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam show us that, maslada, that, 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 that the, the issue revolves on the maslaha wa maslada, the, the benefits and the harms of the issue. You know, is it going to be a greater harm by rebelling to remove this apostate leader? Is it going to be a greater harm in trial from the Muslim? And the case in Syria and all of those places, it's the case. Look at Egypt. Even then now they're trying to go the democratic route. Nobody want the, the 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 West doesn't want to see a, a Muslim government, even if it's uh, even if it's a Khwan Muslimi, and the military government doesn't want to see a Khwan Muslimi. So look at look at what's going on, and and what does it mean for the average Egyptian? It means high price prices. It means a lack of goods. It means inflation. It means uh, it means more uh, turmoil. No, a lack of stability for people. The regular person is just suffering more and more. And they still don't have a, a, a stable government. And look at what's going on. Tunisia may be the best out of those situations. Maybe they have a little better situation. But still, turmoil. What about our brothers and sisters in Libya? They're suffering. So this path of rebellion, which the Khawarij and Tekfiris, they urge, is not the, the minhaj and methodology of Ahl Sunnati wa Jama'ah. And it's the Ahla, it's the minhaj of the people of Fola and the people of Chaos and the people who... Who, who really, in fact, you have to wonder if they really want stability in Islam. Look at what's going on in Somalia. Somalia has been without a government for more than 21 years. More than that. You know, even when they, and even when they began to have a, some sort of stability, of course the West wasn't going to have that. Because it was an Islamic, uh, it was Islamic government. When those, those uh, the group of the Islamic courts, they began, they took over Somalia. They had it. And people, the Somalis were glad. The, even the non-religious Somalis, a lot of them, were ready to go back. They were glad because their country was finally getting stability. But the West didn't want that. They have to always claim that it's terrorism. They don't want to see Islam. You can never hold your hand out and say, oh, please, I know that you don't believe in Islam. Please help us. No, we don't need their, uh, them to substantiate us, to verify for us to assist us. No. Our Islam has to take their own responsibility. And may Allah help us and bless us. Once we begin to help ourselves and change our sins, Allah will help us. We we'll have the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So going back to the, the point at hand, is that Ahl Islam, the, uh, the, the creed of Ahl Sunnah, is not to rebel. And the ulama in the past, the Salaf al we can go back to Kethra. I can bring you many texts. But just go to Sahih Muslim. Look at Sahih Muslim, uh, the chapter of Imara, the chapter of uh, of, of leadership, and you'll find more than, I counted more than a hundred and so, so odd hadith, a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, going against the creed of the Khawarij of rebelling against the Muslim leaders and those neo-Tekfiris and Al-Qaeda and these other people. So, it's very important to know that Ahl Islam, we follow the leader, even if the leader is a wicked leader, we follow them in obedience to Allah, and we don't rebel against them especially if they're still in the fold of Islam and they establish the prayer, as is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in Sahih Muslim. And also for those who know Arabic, go back to Imam Nawawi's explanation of Sahih Muslim and you'll find you know, mountains of gold uh, of, and, and, and benefits about these issues. Look at those books uh, of, of the ulama, of the, the fuqaha, and they talk about the issue of rebellion. Imam, one of the great, biggest books and, and greatest books in fiqh um, that is on the, the madhab of the Hanabila, but it's also, you know, it, it brings all the, you know, it's fiqh muqarana, it's a comparative fiqh, is Imam Al-Maqdasi's uh, Al-Mughni. Al-Mughni, go to Al-Mughni and look, just look at those chapters in, in, in about rebellion and about ridda and stuff like this and about apostasy. And Imam Nawawi spoke ex- wrote extensively upon it. Imam Nawawi is what? He's Shafi'i. So all the ulama, all the fuqaha of the madayim, they have consensus on this, that you cannot rebel against the leader. Go back to the consensus of the Salaf al So, Abdul Sunnah, they do not believe in rebelling and encourage the people to conspire against the, the leaders. They believe that being patient with their oppression, and they do not make that 
make that an excuse to break the Pledge of Allegiance or rebel against them. An oppressive leader in action. According to the saying of the Prophet wasallam, whoever sees something from his ruler he hates, then be patient with him. For verily, there is not anyone who divides the jama'ah, even a handsman, that dies of, except that he dies the death of the days of ignorance. So that means breaking from the jama'ah, breaking from the leader, breaking from the main body of Muslims when you make takfir, like jama'ah and takfir or hijra. They actually made hijra in Egypt to the mountains and made it impermissible to study in the government schools because they regarded the rest of society as disbelievers. This is how far these people will go. How many people do we know that are influenced by this, this uh, aqidah? This is very serious and very dangerous, and that's why we have to know the quiet and principles of opportunity with Jama'ah, and that's why it's important to study treaties, treaties like this and going back to the scholars uh, of before. Then the Shaykh went on to say, Allah Ta'ala, he began to mention the chapter 35 about innovation, and we've talked about this in the other lessons. And he said, innovation is to seek to come closer to Allah the Almighty with something Allah did not legislate, and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not legislate. It is from the greatest things that corrupt a person's religion. Some of the pious predecessors said, said, the devil is happier with innovation more than sin, because sin is repented from, and innovation is not repented from. The reason for that is that the one who innovates thinks that he's coming closer to Allah, the Almighty, through his deeds. And this makes him not repent. There is nothing from the religion called good innovation, bid'ah, hasan. Instead, all innovation is evil and misguidance, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, kulu bid'ah bin dalal. All bid'ah is, is dalal, is misguidance, and leads to the fire. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man ahsana fi amrina hadha wa ma laysa minhu kuwarat. Whoever innovates in this affair, uh, affair of ours, why well, reject it? So whoever brings anything new, if it doesn't have an, an, a, a, a foundation in the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah from Allah and the in the religion, then it's rejected. And innovation is of two types. Innovation is in belief. This is one of the categorizations of the belief, of, of innovation. It's innovation in belief, like the saying of the Jahmiyyah and Mu'tazila in denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes and the Khawarij and Murjia, whose creed is deviant regarding Iman, and other than them from the people of innovation. So this is re regarding belief. There's also innovation in action. This is an open, this is an open act of worship like seeking to come closer to Allah by worship that is not legislated by Allah and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like the remembrance that some of the Sufis practice, the, some of the vicar that's innovated. Like celebrating the birthday of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ascended to the heavens and similar practices. None of these were celebrated by the Sahaba. None of these were celebra celebrated by the best of the Ummah. So what gives you right and authority hundreds of years later to begin to start these practices? And, uh, and these are practices of worship. The last chapter the Shaykh mentioned, chapter 37, he said, the Messenger وسلم, has already prophesied that the community of Muslims will break into 73 sects, all of them in the fire except one, and it is those who are upon what he was upon and his companions, radiallahu ta'ala ajma'in, they cling to the religion correctly and are few amongst the people. They are ahl sunnati wal jama'ah, remaining upon the path of the pious predecessors in knowledge and deeds. From them are the major imams that are followed like Hassan al-Basri, Sufyan al-Thawri, al-Uzai, and Malik, and Shafi'i, and Ahmed, and uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn Qayyum, and Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, and many others. And may Allah have mercy upon them all. All the Almighty, uh, Allah the Almighty knows best. And may peace and blessings be upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Shaykh ended his treaties with that by uh, wrapping up the creed of Ahl Sunnah with Jama'ah. And in that regard, we've mentioned in many of our lectures about the um, the following the Sunnah, the importance of the Sunnah, and Ahl Sunnah being the Akhul of Akhul Sunnah, the foundation of Akhul Sunnah being the Sahaba, Radhi Allah Ta'ala Majma'een, and their creed, and their deeds, and their actions, because they were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they understood the religion better than, uh, than those who came after them, Radhi Allah Ta'ala Majma'een, and that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about them in many ahadith, where, for example, as we mentioned, Ali can be Sunnati with Sunnat al Khulafa, Rashidin al Mahdiin, and it's upon you, my Sunnah, and the Sunnah of the rightly guided. Khalifa and the Prophet Sallallahu said uh, when he was asked about the the uh, the rightly guided 
people, he وسلم, said, Men kana ala mithi wa ma kana alihi wa tabi alyum Those people who are upon what I am upon and what my companions are upon this day And the Prophet وسلم, also mentioned in many many ahadith For example, the Prophet وسلم, said La tazal taifatu min ummati zahari ala bahaq Hatta yatihu ma'amar Allah wa hum ala dhalik Wa kama qala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He salawatu rabbi wa sallamu alayhi said that there won't cease to be a group from amongst my nation that is um, on the truth no one will harm them that uh, tends to deceive them or or goes against them uh, until the day of judgment so there will always, the Sunnah will always be regardless if you see in your community or you see in your country or you see in your state many people going astray that you have to know and believe in that hadith with yaqeen that Ahl Sunnah will always be present there will always be a group as the Prophet Sallallahu said exactly in that hadith he said La tazal taifatum min ummati he said there won't cease to be a group from amongst my community that's on the haq that's on the truth Ahl Sunnah is always going to be mojud Ahl Sunnah will always be present Ahl Sunnah, Ahl Haq will always be present so never gain despair and as the ulama used, uh, said, the Salaf used to say you know, be on the Sunnah even if you're alone, even if you're by yourself. You may be in a community, you may be all alone. Maybe the only person who has some knowledge and really has, it, it, you know, to message the Sunnah like this. And, 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 and follows and is in accordance with the ulama and, and, and follows the, the, the statements of the scholars. And tries to seek knowledge. You may be the only one, you may be a few in your community. But never despair, because the Prophet has already promised us that they will always be there. But however, another important point with this is that we also have to be careful of, 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 of separating ourselves from others. Meaning that believing that we are on the truth and others are on falsehood. We have to be very cautious about that. We have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's how the companions were. Radhi Allah ta'ala. That's how the Prophet sallallahu wa was first and foremost. And that's the, the, the example of the Salaf al Is that they didn't, they weren't quick to take people off the sunnah. And they weren't quick to distance themselves from the people. But they distanced themselves from those people whose bid'ah was known. When bid'ah innovation was known and people's wickedness was known, then they distanced themselves. But as regards to the regular people, then if you have the ability to teach them, then teach them. Be patient with them and teach them. This is what Ahl Sunnah is doing. This is the example we have of our ulama here. And living in Saudi Arabia, we see a lot of benefits from the scholars. And many of the scholars that I've seen uh, and, and benefited from their manners and I see that they don't turn away people from their lectures they bring the people if the people come alhamdulillah they benefit many of the scholars I've seen I've seen major scholars and I've seen scholars that are status are less than them but they still were on the same minhaj they were on the same methodology and the same path and they had good manners and a good uh, a good path where you see that in the future they may be some of the major scholars and some of the major scholars that I've seen were that were benefiting, that they're known from Ahl Sunnah, following the Salaf al and, and, and going against Bid'ah. But they, they don't turn the people away and scare the people, but they stay firm on the Sunnah. Imams like Muhaddithin, like uh, Sheikh Abdul Masjid al Abbad, Tabi Allah Ta'ala in Medina, in the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid, we see this from the Sheikh, from the Alim Rabbani. We see this from his son, who's young and who's not nowhere on the level of his, his father but he's on that same methodology because he, he concerns himself with affairs of the heart and he doesn't speak much but he teaches he teaches the people he teaches the people Fahmuddin. he teaches the people a manners he doesn't entertain garbage he doesn't bring fitna and allow fitna to be around him we see this from our scholars like Sheikh Suleiman Rahali we see this from our scholars like Sheikh Ibrahim Rahali we see this from our scholars like Sheikh Ubaid Jabri. We see this from our scholars like Sheikh Fali uh, uh, Suhaimi, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab al Aqil. We see this from the many scholars, and there's so many in Medina, those who have more knowledge than them and have less knowledge than them, who have bring nothing but the Sunnah and bring us so much khair, and we see so much good from their manners, and we love them, and we want to follow and benefit from their knowledge. And may Allah preserve all of the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, and may Allah help all the Muslimin in every place, and may Allah bless us to be beneficial and for his his face and may Allah forgive me for any sins and any mistakes I've made 
اللهم إني أعوذ بك أن أشرك بك وأنا على مستقبل قديم أن ما أعلمه and may Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala raise the Muslims everywhere to come in and may Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala bless our brothers and sisters in Surya and forgive uh, of the Muslims everywhere and unite the hearts of the believers and bless us to return back to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the understanding of the Salaf Asari. May Allah protect us from dividing into sects and groups and hating one another and killing one another and fighting one another but rather be united on Kitab Allah wa Sunnah to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and may Allah have mercy upon all of our ulama. The ulama of this day and age, we, we, we've lost so many giants in, in, in the past 10 to 15 years. Imam, Imam al-Albani, Imam uh, bin Baz, Imam uh, bin Uthameen, Imam Muqbil bin Hadi al-Wadi'i, Allah yahamuhum, and, and many other Imams, Imams before them and Imams after them with law. How many? How many? And, and it will continue to be because the end will be taken. And so we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves our scholars and may Allah bless us all to be on the path of Ayn. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, to al Muslim, that seeking knowledge is, a, is a, an obligation on every Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَنْ يَرِدُ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يَتَقَوْهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives them knowledge of the understand uh, of the religion. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيكًا يَلْتَمِّسُهُ بِهِ عَلْمًا سَعَلَ اللَّهُ طَرِيكًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ That whenever Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, that whoever strives to be on the path of knowledge, then Allah will make easy for him the path to paradise. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us in our talib al ilm and forgives us for our sin. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.